So uh, I work at, um, formerly it was called uh, Hungarian Academy of Sciences, but then uh, the government of Hungary decided to put a research institute under its uh, more closer inspection. So now I work uh, in the Utrecht Lorand Research Network. I still learned the, the new name of this. Uh, and yeah, I got involved in night studies by uh, researching gentrification in an area of Budapest, where instead of like normal gentrification, we experienced uh, price increase and displacement of people by uh, basically nighttime economic tourism. So uh, this this uh, this um, gentrification and um, Basically, all these um, related questions of uh, power is my research in in interest. And yeah, I'm a sociologist, so uh, I may be less uh, practice oriented, but uh, in my ethnographic research, I meet a lot of practice oriented people and, and uh, entrepreneurs. So I hope I can you know, uh, say something useful here as well. And now I try to share my yeah. Okay, so it's supposed to be my yeah, I'm sharing my presentation. So Manuel already told me the told the, the title, so I won't uh, waste more time with that. Basically this uh how do I ah okay, this is just small. So uh, I will just quickly talk about the Budapest situation just to introduce um, the, 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 the context of where COVID arrived. And I was interested in, in local uh, movements related to these conflicts with nighttime economic tourism. And uh, then I uh, changed to, you know, uh, the under and after COVID uh, issues. So I will talk about how uh, governmental aid worked or actually didn't work in the Hungarian uh, case. And also in this uh, political context of Hungary, a quite alarming new uh, possible future of the nighttime in, in Budapest is, uh, is basically uh, a government supported and uh, founded new nighttime area. And the, the whole goal of this presentation is to show that when uh, we are talking about, you know, what to do after COVID and how to come to, um, you know, less problematic solutions that happened with the over tourism and, and uh, the, all the problems that uh, like nighttime to is caused. So how to, um, there are, there are uh, talks about how to, how to avoid these problems or how to fix these problems. Uh, I will just show uh, with this case study that uh, you need to have a very uh, specific institutional background to, to do this work. And if you don't have it first, uh, you need to make that possible. So this is the city of Budapest. Uh, these are my uh, research areas and I'm going to talk about this particular, I don't know if you see my Pointer, but I'm going to talk about this particular area and the adjacent areas. This is really the historic university of uh, Budapest. It's a few kilometers. And uh, with another Google uh, map. So it shows how very densely built this uh, area is. And yeah, until uh, recently there were uh, uh, more than 10,000, uh, more than 20,000 people living in this half square kilometer area. And on the other hand, there were like 300 bars in the same area. So first, uh, just a very quick uh, um, about the theoretical background of my work. So I'm among the post-socialist uh, researchers who think that post-socialism does make sense. It's not just Semi periphery, it's not just, uh, you know, an outdated concept. Uh, because how 
privatization happened in these countries and how politics had control in in economy, like to a very great extent, uh, uh, caused uh, instead of the universal and, and worldwide use neoliberal narrative of uh, the world, uh, there are uh, very strong new patrimonial elements in this in this con uh, context, which basically just means that especially currently, but it happened uh, also before the rule of uh, current, there is no better word, state party, that uh, politicians were actually controlling uh, certain markets and certain companies, or political interests were interfered in market relations. So when, you know, you give the, the narrative that uh, market relations rule the world and, um, you know, a, 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 politics uh, also depend on those, uh, uh, these Eastern European examples uh, back to differ. Um, so the good example for these uh, relations is the 1990s, uh, early 1990s privatization of uh, formerly uh, state-owned rental apartments. So basically uh, very low status people with very, very little cash were uh, able to become owners and the, the, the uh, formerly tenement houses uh, became so-called condominiums and people owned their apartments and the whole usually bad uh, quality building is in their shared ownership. So this ownership structure actually slowed down gentrification in Budapest and even uh, in early 2000s, 2010s, uh, even Neil Smith himself said that he's surprised that the uh, gentrification in Budapest didn't go as far as he thought it would be. Then uh, another example of this new patrimonial relations is how actually privatization happened in this research area of mine, which was a rehabilitation area. So this uh, apartment by apartment privatization did not happen there. But in the early 2000s, the mayor uh, basically sold buildings, this, this uh, municipality owned buildings to uh, companies owned by himself and other local politicians. So uh, this was the corruption. Part of it, they, they, these buildings were sold for very low price and then these uh, companies secretly owned by local politicians were sold to uh, actual investors, uh, not in every case. And as a Consequence of this, um, this uh, corrupt privatization, uh, the ruin bars appeared in this area. Basically, they are bars in buildings that are in ruins. The buildings used to be residential buildings, and now these inner courtyards I showed you on the on this picture uh, serve as as patterns of of bars or, or served right before COVID. Uh, there are there are several articles uh, appearing also offered by um, my colleagues and me, but the first one actually appeared uh, by Peter Lugoshi, you may know his name. So uh, yeah, you can check this out if you're interested. And uh, the other uh, important um, political or social background is how after 2008, uh, uh, Planning and rock and regulation was uh, severely uh, limited. So basically, local authorities did not have any other uh, authority just to set the closing times of enterprises. But for example, they had no planning rights to say that, okay, these kind of enterprises can work in our area and others can't. It was actually because there was widespread corruption when there was, you know, uh, giving uh, licenses, any kind of business licenses before. So people wanted to uh, open a shop in, uh, in a given municipality and the municipality just asked for, you know, corruption money to give actually the permit. So that yeah, had, it had uh, uh, good reasons that this change happened. It just is uh, overdone pretty much. And Basically, after 2013, in my research area, 
uh, ever so, uh, this, this nighttime economy tourism group started in 2008 and 2010, there were the first signs. And by 2013, the problems became severe and people were complaining. And the local authority uh, in this uh, municipality I'm researching just decided that this even area, this more, more central area of the municipality, there are no rules. And the reason for that was, among others, uh, is that um, there were many entrepreneurs already strongly related to uh, the currently ruling party since, uh, since 2010. So this is important that uh, local regulations, local politics uh, in Hungary are overruled by national politics in a second. Even if it's uh, breaking the law, they just make new laws. So on the other hand, uh, this area became a uh, very concentrated nighttime area because in adjacent districts, uh, the local authorities introduced early closing times. Uh, and the only, uh, how to say, uh, regulation was that uh, places which were also hosting civil uh, societies, uh, often against the politics of uh, Mr. Orban, were uh, constantly visited by the police and other authorities. So this is a ruin bar, it's already closed. Uh, I got this picture from the owner of the exclusive. This is another one that looks completely different by now. But this is how you can imagine that empty old buildings are now filled with colorful trash. And this is something towards uh, that. So, of course, there was uh, okay, uh, just to talk about, like, uh, because I mentioned liberalism. So I mentioned new patrimonialism as a um, described to the economic relations. And I, I mentioned illiberalism, uh, which which is used in the sense maybe Mr. Orban didn't use it in this sense, uh, but in 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 sociologist way it is used that liberal distribution uh, of powers is is violated in Hungary very strongly. The European Union is you know not happy about it. I think Polish colleagues uh, have similar experiences, but um, you know, actually not, not much happened. So this means that even if there are constitutional rules, the constitution can be changed at any time because uh, uh, the state party has constitutional majority. And, and they just uh, you know, change the institutional system and uh, have their uh, faithful others in basically any kind of institution. So I wrote about rewriting the electoral rules, but actually the leader of the National Electoral Committee is, there is no better word, the devotee of Mr. Orban. So central power is virtually uncontrolled. And well, in this context, you can imagine that if, if the only thing that matters is to win national elections, then local movements are, how to say, not very important. So if they have some local problem, uh, this lost some elections uh, in 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 the in the local level, but uh, basically the you know, we we are living in a world since like the last five hundred years where sovereignty power is related to the national level. Uh, so basically, um, this makes uh, local movements um, less significant. And on the other hand, like. Having um, opposition parties in this environment rather exists for themselves you know, to, to be, uh, be politicians because uh, winning the elections in this uh, environment is really hard. And then also uh, social movements are often hijacked by even opposition political parties or by people who are, want to be politi poli uh, professional politicians. So this is what actually happened in this neighborhood. First, there were just angry residents uh, organizing like successful uh, demonstrations and other events, and the press was all about it. 
And then, uh, well, I followed closely how the, the group broke into smaller parts and the part which was like going for becoming professional politicians got into actually the, the local council. And then, of course, during these struggles, they were not supported by the opposition parties because they didn't merge with them. And on the other hand, like currently, this very um, like bottom up movement is now in the local council, um, actually, is supported by the now minority Fidesz. Uh, so, this is just a picture of the gathering. There were many people in many cases do something about this neighborhood. And then the other contextual. Uh, uh, feature of this uh, illiberal context, which hinders, you know, coming up uh, with new solutions and, and negotiations, is the, the huge level of mistrust between entrepreneurs. So, I already said some entrepreneurs are very strongly related to the state party. It's one thing. The other thing is, uh, you know, the size of these enterprises uh, and their uh, focus, if it's on tourism or or uh, to local clientele, but the huge places are usually uh, focused on huge groups of tourists. Like they arrived like bus to the bar, several buses of tourists unloaded, went to the bar, drank the whole menu, and then yeah. And then in 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 smaller places it's different. And also, there is a there is a huge mistrust uh, in, in in politics uh, from the side of the uh, entrepreneurs. So these are all problems, and th this is how. Uh, so th this picture just shows no step parties. Even this couldn't be you know agreed on. Uh, so very quickly. Uh, uh, but the COVID crisis in Hungary. So this data, like 233 million euros in during COVID in the summer of 2020 was given by the Hungarian government to build new hotels all around the country. And all this, um, you know, all this money was given to entrepreneurs closely related to the state party. It's not just about strengthening their economic power, but politicians from this many, many times EU money, just get their kickbacks. So I get free money from the government, but you know, to get this free money, I have to give it like usually 30% of it back to the politician who decided that I can get this money. And then there was, so this was 83 billion foreign and only 1 billion foreign was for keeping tourism jobs. And this is the example of the bar, Simpla, which is also in Berlin and Budapest. In Berlin, they didn't have to lay off anyone. In Budapest, 106 out of 116 employees were laid off. Uh, and yeah, so this is the Hungarian hotel industry is taking over. And, you know, the reason why the parliament wasn't burning after this very bad, uh, Crisis management was that uh, Mr. Orban uh, promised that uh, we're going to be, you know, over COVID much quicker than uh, uh, other countries. But we are not over COVID, but uh, you know, we we don't have any rules basically currently. We cannot have like events above five thousand, and basically that's that's the thing. Uh, and now uh, many many places of the COVID have closed. And uh, so there were there were creative solutions like you know opening terraces even for places that didn't have. In my research area where there was a, there was the most bars, this uh, uh, for, um, supposedly uh, independent uh, member of the council who who uh, was helped yeah, by the social movement was of course furious to give any help to, to bar owners. You know, her agenda was against bar owners. So even if it's COVID, uh, no help. 
Uh, so this uh, resulted in currently uh, in a dispersion of nightlife in Budapest. So instead of this only one place where also you know over tourism was, more and more places open up in other districts. Uh, but then there was no cha change in planning rules or regulative capacities of the local level, and there was no talk about this. Even like Airbnb rules were changed, and basically the uh, government of Hungary said that, okay, uh, local authorities can decide if they want Airbnb or not. And the most interesting thing is just to the end that, uh, so in one particular area of the city, I'll show it to be, these are places where there are uh, brownfield areas where there are uh, parties like raves or, or, or rock concerts. They are far away from the city. This area is owned by the state. And now this commissar uh, uh, of uh, Mr. Orban is organizing uh, there a party area and uh, inviting uh, bars and other venues to participate in this. So there is space. You can come, you can rent it uh, for cheap. But that means, of course, it, 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 nothing is realized yet, but that means uh, in this system, loyalty, at least, you know, not saying bad things about the party, but rather saying good things. And this is a weird thing because before that, these bars were actually gathering points of opposition movements and opposition parties. So uh, I just I just uh, summarize this. Uh, the point is that uh, this case study shows that you can have all the negotiations and nice ideas and um, yeah, come to compromises and try to come to compromises. But if there is no institutional and political background for it, uh, it won't happen. So, uh, for other Eastern European countries, I just really who are you know haunted by the specter of illiberalism. I just really say in every conference that maybe you don't like uh, your opposition choice parties, but you have to first you have to be sure that uh, the illiberal party in your country doesn't get constitutional majority, and then you can start to think what to do. And the other danger or, or problem that is happening in Hungary that because there is no such thing uh, that is independently collecting or doing something with nightlife, uh, young people uh, organizing illegal events, even you know if it's allowed COVID-wise to have like a few hundred people somewhere, but uh, there is no ambulance, there is no so it, it will be it will be dangerous um, to do this. And I stop here because I'm like missing. No. Thank you very much, Sir Joey. So next ones to talk in this case will be Jenny. Jenny, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Brilliant. Well, as you know, you have 20 minutes as well, Jenny and Brendan. I am not quite sure if you can start sharing your PowerPoint. We will have all the questions after all the presenters have finished. So the stage is yours. Um, thank you, Manuel. I'm just trying to share content, but the button's grayed out right now. So do you need to give me permission? Yeah, Jordi is going to give you and grant you that permission. I will ask you to you start introducing yourself a little bit to, to know you better. And um, I presume that now it's not it just Jordi is fixing that. So please, Jenny, go ahead. Oh hi. Um I'm Jenny Hall. Um I'm lecturer at York Business School, York St. John University. You can try to share your your presentation. Can change your privilege, I don't know. If you um move on by the panelists, um move the square box with the arrow. 
Yeah, I did Ask it. The presenter icon, if you drag it to Jenny's name, then it will, she'll be able to share her screen. Mm. I think only you can do that. I cannot do it. Actually, I did it with Jerry in the other session. And you can do it again. So. No, I don't know. Mm. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. No, wait. Because it's still active for me. Change board. Because it should be. Make presenter. Okay. Okay, brilliant. I can see that now. Mm. Try it again. Yeah. Okay, just one second. Um... Okay, do you see that? Is that fine? Okay, yes. brilliant. Okay, so we'll just start again. <laughs> so I'm Jenny Hall, I'm a lecturer at York Business School. And um, just to introduce my colleague, Brendan. Oh, hi, everyone. I'm Brendan Patterson. I'm also a lecturer at the Business School at York St. John University. And thank you very much for having us today. It's nice to be here and see you all. So, um, in response to the session, um, we're going to explore the wider policy implications of which the night time um, is one element. Um, following the devastating impact of COVID-19 on tourism, um, COVID-19 has offered the industry a moment to reflect and reimagine what its role should be in rebuilding the tourist historic city um, for a more sustainable future. So, our research seeks to critically explore governance and policy making um, with the aim to appreciate how harm is socially and historically constructed by exploring the effects of globalization and economically focused tourism policy. Um, using York UK as our primary case study, um, we're going to draw on a green criminological theory um, to offer a model for understanding the inequalities and geographies of harm tourism, tourism policies produce. Our aim is to demonstrate the implications this has for future policy making in historic cities and ultimately their ecological health. Um, so we're delighted to be sharing with you our preliminary findings and we really welcome um, your feedback and comments as we look to take this research forward. Brendan. So, thanks Jen, Jenny. So just provide some context to this particular research project. As destinations emerge from the pandemic, striving to achieve a balance between uh, development and sustainability is at the forefront of contemporary tourism debates. Over tourism, the climate crisis, the availability and quality of tourism work have drawn attention to the unsustainable nature of the current industrial neoliberal models of tourism. And in addition, the pandemic has heightened issues of urban vulnerability particularly for those destinations like York, where tourism is a major economic activity. So the promise of sustainability and social transformation are often empty where policymakers have concentrated on sustaining tourism, economically that is, over greater social, cultural and environmental objectives. And if these concerns that we just outlined regarding the impact of tourism are to be addressed, then the unlocking of the industry is an opportunity to think radically about the purpose of tourism for a more sustainable future. So the democratization of leisure and tourism, liberalized by consumer capitalism, has placed leisure on a pedestal of all that is good socially, economically and culturally. The more unique a place is, the more sought after it will be. And commodification threatens the sustainability of these spaces. Globalization has intensified these competitive pressures so that tourism development is seen as central to the economic development where success is measured in jobs created, the multiplier effect and inward investment. And these imperatives are reflected in the tourism strategies and result in traditional tourism management approaches.
So for this particular research project, we chose York as our main case study. Uh, both Jenny and I are based in York, so it's illogical to start with York. Um, tourism is York's biggest economic sector, and prior to the pandemic, the city welcomed an estimated 8.4 million visitors a year. Uh, that was in 2019. So the losses suffered in 2021 and in 2020 itself um, were significant and are still being quantified. But this does make York a very interesting case study for us to focus um, our particular research project on. So, um, as our point for analysis, um, we turn to um, green criminology as a tool to analyse how policy impacts on tourism in the city. And building on green criminological theory, we wanted to critically appreciate how geographies of harm are socially and historically constructed by exploring the effects of globalisation, governance and policy making on diverse communities in the historic city of York. Green criminology is concerned with the study of harms affecting humans, non-humans and ecosystems and fundamentally is about justice. For example, what is and importantly what is not considered to be an environmental crime is determined by powerful social interests of nation states and the policies they create. Policies that support leisure and tourism can be harmful and thus deviant, whether officially recognised or not. So, building on the work of um, Thomas Raymond and Oliver Smith um, and their theorization that the neoliberal commodification of leisure is a deviant force producing multiple legal, yet arguably criminal harms socially, culturally and economically and environmentally of various kinds, we explored two key factors. Firstly, how public policy and governance procedures produce geographies of harm that excludes, discriminates and produces inequalities for inhabitants and the wider ecology of historic cities. And secondly, how historic cities could move beyond this through the lessons learned during COVID-19. So very briefly then, in terms of our methodology, we adopted an interpretivist approach. Um, we conducted semi-structured interviews with a purposeful sample of, uh, up to this particular point, eight key stakeholders. We do have more interviews planned as this project progresses. And those um, respondents included public officials, business leaders, and various tourism stakeholders um, working in tourism or tourism related areas across the city. And those interviews took place uh, the spring, summer of this year, 2021. We adopted a thematic approach to our data analysis and we used MVivo to help support us with this. And as a consequence, our analysis produced 18 codes and subcodes, which we've grouped together under themes such as farm, social change, sustainability and governance. So, our initial analysis identified themes where harm is manifest, such as approaches towards economic policy and governance and the impacts this has on stakeholders. We then identified opportunities and challenges faced by maximising upon post-pandemic hopeful signs emerging that could enable the renewal of tourism in historic cities. So our first theme that emerged from analysis was economic policy harms. Um, these were harms identified that um, originate from tourism policy in York being founded on an economic growth model. And the structural nature of the harms this produces for tourism in York are complex. As apparent in many tourist historic destinations, tourism has played a large part as a substitution industry replacing the manufacturing industries that have declined almost to the point of extinction over the last 20 years. As evident in York, the local authority have been obligated through their economic development, inward investment and employment growth policies to find suitable alternatives. And this has largely been through tourism. As a consequence, tourism is seen essential to economic development where success is measured in terms of the number of jobs created, the multiplier effect and the level of investment that brings to the city. Tourism in this context becomes appropriated by corporate interests, leaving arguably a deficit in relation to the environmental, social 
cultural and ethical impacts of tourism. In York, our research found that this manifested itself through workplace inequalities, transient jobs, and the narrowing of the kinds of businesses that can survive in the marketplace. Also, the city authority appears to have limited power to manage unplanned growth. Retail and public spaces suffer from a lack of investment and produce an unattractive atmosphere that is not conducive to supporting the local community. This is exacerbated by high private rentals that exclude the growth of local distinctive businesses, resulting in the McDonaldization of the high streets that so many towns and cities experience. The second theme that uh, emerged from analysis focused on governance policy harms. And governance harms in the context of York manifest where historically the city authority in York have devolved responsibility for the development and delivery of tourism management to an external organisation. And currently, the organisation responsible for tourism in York is Make It York. Our research illustrated how the interpretation of a new public management approach resulted in a managerial form of governance where tourism activities are centralised around the destination management organisation. This approach indicated a structure that was far from participatory. In fact, we found that this had resulted in a democratic deficit as the ultimate outcome pointed towards a local elite dominating the decision making process. The adoption of a membership model, which is an important funding stream for the DMO in the city, prevents the involvement of all relevant stakeholders in destination management and decision making. This can result in the closing up of the policy process, leading to corporate interests dominating decision making and policy implementation, as was apparent in York. The implication of this is the development of tourism strategy and destination development that gives priority to economic growth over social factors and neglects to take into consideration how the benefits of tourism are distributed. Also, we found that the DMO tends to focus its marketing activity on attracting international inbound visitors, despite the majority of tourists visiting the city being from local, regional and national markets. Arguably, this is a missed opportunity to maximise on building stability and sustainability through local market opportunities. This has resulted in local people feeling excluded from the city because there was little, and I quote one of our respondents here, recognition that the city centre was owned by York people. And so our third theme um, refers to stakeholder policy harms. And these were manifest through the development of a cultural strategy that was driven by econ an economic growth model that marginalised grass cultural production. For example, when producing the cultural strategy for York, instead of beginning with what existed locally, the public authorities saw external expertise from the UK National Arts Council and hired an external consultant to undertake public consultation. The result was a top-down approach where cultural leaders from major cultural institutions were consulted first, setting the agenda for policy making, followed by a targeted consultation with residents and local businesses. Devolving the management of such public consultation meant that the cultural strategy largely excluded the social and cultural expression of residents and local businesses. Grassroots cultural production was not perceived as a solution for cultural or economic development in the city. Powerful leading attractions such as York Museums Trust are driven by the need to create cultural product that will produce an economic return and ensure their survival. Local cultural production is not seen as a way to help the financial survival of powerful organisations such as the DMO and attractions like York Museums Trust. And was reflected in a senior public official's comment that, and I quote, the visitor economy, it's really about the future of our cultural institutions and new product. The harm manifests in a homogenizing force where tourism leaders look beyond the city for creative solutions, procure highbrow cultural product, inward investment and expertise, 
opting to parachute in cultural product like Christmas markets, for example, that are not rooted in the cultural or social life of the city. This compounds the marginalization of local cultural expression and perceptions of exclusion amongst local residents and businesses. As one research participant explained that it was a question of how to bring localism back into the city in order to reanimate and invigorate the city's cultural and social life. So just to sort of move on to um, the opportunities that the pandemic has, um, has uh, offered to the city of York, it's opened up new and unique opportunities um, through galvanizing communities to work together to overcome major challenges. And this was true of York, and we've seen this on a global level. The opportunities emerging from COVID-19 highlight the benefits of developing localized solutions for managing not marketing tourism in the city of York. The research identified several approaches and here I'm going to identify just one. So York City Council stepped in and facilitated the reopening of York for tourism in the summer of 2020, creating, as one research participant described, as a unique moment of good coordination by shifting the emphasis from marketing to management, led interestingly by York City Council and not the DMO, provided an opportunity for repurposing tourism towards a more collaborative, co-produced and pro-social environment. This shift towards co-producing local solutions with local stakeholders led to extraordinary achievements, with major attractions opening their doors, making what were pay for services free and digitizing cultural product and providing a co coordinated and co-produced approach to welcoming local, regional and national visitors to the city. Through developing localized approaches, the city outperformed its projected visitor numbers. So in terms of uh, a conclusion then, and to bring our presentation uh, to a close, so the, um, our research has found that the challenges producing harm arise from the commodifying forces of globalization that push city authorities such as York to develop cultural and tourism policy based on economic development imperatives. This produces harms that marginalize local residents through governance processes that favor international inbound tourism over local forms of tourism. So reimagining the city of York needs policy that shifts from treating tourism as a poor cousin and instead invests in its social and cultural health. And to achieve social change and bring local life back to the city, it was felt that the public authorities, and I quote one of our respondents here, need to connect with stakeholders in a genuine open forum, which then develops a community strategy that allows the city to move forward as a whole. And that's it. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Brilliant presentation. Thank you. So, Robert, Magda? Ah, uh, just let me uh, change yes. role, my presenter. <clears throat> okay. Let's do it. I think I'm there. Yes. I think you can share your presentation. Yes, yes, I'll try. I will try just now. Mm -hmm. Continue. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I hope it's visible. So, um, <clears throat> I thank you for having me uh, this uh, this day on this conference. I'm representing the team uh, of uh, three researchers: Robert Pawlyszynski, me, and uh, Marek Grochowicz. We are all from the Institute of Geography and Spatial Management, Jagiellon University in Krakow. We are all geographers. And uh, together, uh, we are forming uh, the team who is uh, dealing with um, uh, a tourism pressure problem over tourism in Krakow, who is doing research on in that area. And as well, uh, especially Robert and Marek, they are more focusing turning into, into the aspects of nighttime, the nighttime economy. 
Today, uh, I would uh, I would like to present uh, the results of our ongoing research on uh, emerging questions: how to develop nighttime economy uh, in tourism in the in the historic city uh, in this um, crazy time post COVID era. Uh, referring to the present pandemic and closure of many tourism destinations in many cities, catering facilities, gastronomy and attractions for tourism, uh, we are wondering how to shape uh, nighttime economy after COVID-19, uh, uh, learning from before COVID-19 experience, uh, before uh, b uh, mistakes uh, before that area. And uh, we are trying to seek answers also in the regard of the actions of municipal uh, authorities and the city hall in Krakow. Uh, I will also present the results uh, conducted among entrepreneurs of nighttime economy operating before and during uh, the, uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, the, uh, between the second and the third uh, wave. Uh, and the, the and the second and the third uh, lockdown in Poland. Mm, so those research initial research uh, results going to be presented. Uh, yeah, I have a problem with. Oh yes, it's now. Uh, so. This topic was inspired by the changes in um, uh, urban tourism uh, in Europe, uh, which were taking place uh, before COVID-19, uh, especially in the context of historical cities as Krakow is, um, before the COVID area. Uh, cities started to be perceived as a place for holidays and recreation uh, with this concept of city of play. Um, COVID pandemic actually cut, stopped uh, those trends in urban tourism in Krakow. Uh, based on that, those questions emerged. What, what, what can we expect after COVID-19 in Krakow? Uh, is it only uh, the perspective of safety and slow life? Uh, does COVID-19 uh, reshape nighttime economy in Krakow? And of course, to what extent? Uh, what is about the new reality uh, in nighttime economy in urban tourism after COVID pandemic. Uh, of course, we know March 2020, the, the world has frozen. These are the examples of cities that uh, before COVID-19 pandemic struggled with the problem of over tourism, crowds, uh, uh, progressive tourist pressure, attempts of regulating the nighttime economy and the nightlife of the city. Uh, researchers have uh, have been involved in the development on on the night time night time economy concept and research uh, since the 80s. Uh, this period can be divided into four stages, which are here presented. But actually, COVID-19 led us to enter into the fifth phase. Uh, that uh, uh, mm, mm, actually we do not know what to expect from there. Uh, it is because um, COVID stopped the whole hospitality sector in many different cities uh, into a very different stage uh, at, the at, the, at the very different stages of development and with so big background of uh, those overcrowding or uh, over tourism problems. Um, I would even, I'm tempted even to say that night activity uh, in the city uh, for the first time uh, since the Middle Ages, uh, has been forbidden for good because of COVID. Uh, to varied degrees, uh, to different dimensions, COVID, COVID, COVID had shut down nighttime, nighttime economies, uh, and entrepreneurships, and cities at night. Uh, so a new set of questions emerged, arised about new paths of nighttime economy development in tourist city centers. Uh, these questions uh, relate to issues, how to develop a nighttime economy and tourism in the city after COVID-19, uh, particularly in the case of Krakow, what are the good omens uh, for nighttime economy uh, after COVID-19. Will the situation bring new opportunities for the city and what framework needs to be created 
uh, on the um, administrative level uh, for the sustainable uh, management of the leisure industry and uh, nighttime economy. Uh, briefly, description of Krakow, why this uh, problem matters uh, for us. Uh, Krakow, similar to other Central European uh, historical cities, has continued on the path of intense tourism development for the last two decades. Krakow is a city located in the southern of Poland with its history, functions, uh, traditions, cultural heritage, heritage with Jewish heritage and popularity among a city break tourists is compared to, to Czech Prague. Uh, this area is only the, the city is only uh, three uh, over three hundred uh, three hundred kilometers square big, and is populated by over eight hundred uh, thousand people. Krakow is also an academic city, uh, with about uh, more than two hundred thousand students and a home and a workplace for uh, more than one hundred expats millennials. Uh, Krakow, due uh, its uh, historical assets with a wide range of low cost entertainment offer, it has become one of the leading tourist destination in this part of Europe. Uh, in 2019, Krakow was visited by over 14 million tourists, uh, visitors, among them 72% were tourists, more than two thirds of them are domestic tourists, uh, the rest are international tourists from all over the Europe, also uh, US and Canada. Uh, there is a constant increase in statistics on tourism, especially after 2004, when Poland joined the European Union uh, uh, structures. Uh, these high uh, rates are related uh, inter alia with the development of low cost airlines and a network of low budget air connections, as well as the emergence of new forms of accommodation in cities, apartments, Airbnb sector, and so on. The following year years were about to uh, bring further increase. Uh, what I have to mention is that uh, the greatest concentration of tourism traffic is taking place in the main city center in the first district, which is called the Old Town, and the two points, two core areas, two core zones um, in this area. So Stare Miasto, the Old Market, and the Kazimierz district with the Jewish, uh, Jewish heritage. Uh, what is more, the indicators show that the old town is crowded, is really crowded. City congestion can be illustrated by the ratio of the number of tourists per number of inhabitants in Krakow. While in the city of Krakow, there is about 70 tourists per one inhabitant, one resident. In the first district of old town, there is over 400 tourists per one resident, and the value has increased four times since 2004. Uh, like in Budapest, as was mentioned before, and Prague, the explosion of light, nightlife was a manifestation of the dark side of this tourism boom. Cheap alcohol, which drove clubbing and pub crawls, has been has become a, an element of the city tourism. The city break offer, an offer based on fun, cheaply available alcohol, became a new and a very vivid part of urban tourism offer. A pub crawls in Krakow at night was not not an, uh, a typical meeting of a bunch of friends, but reached enormous size of whole like summer camps, I could say. Stock parties, hen parties, pub crawls uh, of massive scale since 2007 become an everyday element of the landscape, intensifying mostly at weekends. Uh, this uh, since 2003. Uh, the, the city policy was focused on bringing as much tourists to Krakow as could accommodate. Examples are those two advertisement campaigns appearing, uh, appearing in the media all over Poland, inviting tourists to Krakow. They also appeared in the information brochures and TV screens on low-cost airlines operating to Poland. Uh, on the left picture, you can see the image of the city uh, poster, uh, the campaign titled, uh, uh, titled uh, uh, Krakow, uh, there is no time for sleep. On the right side, uh, you, you have uh, another advertising campaign, uh, symbols of Polish cities, tired at partying. Gdańsk is represented by Neptune, Mikołaj Copernicus represents Toruń, and the mermaid in the middle represents Warsaw, the capital. And the slogan um, is very interesting choice, uh, word choice. Uh, because uh, it is written here, Krakow is celebrating, it's hard to go back home. We all, of course, understand that it means 
you cannot to leave that place because you are partying so hard and it's so nice and we can stay here longer. But actually, this Polish word, uh, cho word choice means not only it's very hard to go back home, it means it's very hard to get back on your feet later after the night. Uh, the city based on its tourism growth uh, on cheap tourism, city breaks, low cost, cheap accommodation. The image of the city is in the media, in the line with this city policy was created through the prism of cheap tourism, uh, sprinkled with cheap uh, alcohol. In 2019, uh, mm, mm, uh, it was the cheap nightlife of Krakow that was mentioned by visitors as at the third, at the sixth important attraction in the city after, of course, the most important historical landmark of the city, like the Castle, Babel Hills and the cathedrals there. Uh, we also see the intensity of the use of nighttime economy establishments uh, at various times in the night in Krakow before COVID. It is 2019. Here is an example of the Krakow district Kazimierz, about which we can see that it's uh, that this district sleeps very briefly and is open till 5, 5 and 6 a.m. in the morning. Uh, in the interviews that we uh, that we uh, had chance to uh, uh, to uh, conduct in 2018 and 2019, uh, we had an opportunity to uh, um, uh, to uh, to ask the residents of the old town in Krakow uh, how do they perceive the tourism and over tourism problem, and it was clear that the inhabitants do not mind tourists but only those who visited the city to sightseeing, discovering cultural heritage, example, for example, Jewish district, Jewish heritage, explore, behave quietly and neatly. The opposite is the attitude of the residents towards loud, noisy, of the, often drunk tourists who are stereotypically identified with, uh, with UK tourists, with Brits. Moreover, uh, such high profile behavior is taken over uh, by Polish tourists visiting Krakow and the residents uh, of the old town. After uh, that behavior, uh, they are not uh, very e able to identify whether the dirt and uh, rubbish on the streets was left by foreign tourists or Polish tourists or even the residents. Um, therefore, almost uh, until the outbreak of the pandemic, foreign tourists in Krakow when considered the worst evil because they stood out from the crowd with their clothes, uh, uh, language and noise. Uh, sometimes even they were just not dressed. Uh, mainly the Brits were identified uh, by the city residents as the, 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 the worst evil of the night activity. Uh, local initiatives of grassroots activists, uh, often from resident side, uh, responded to, to, to that tourism uh, pressure. So um, uh, the campaign was launched, keep the noise down. Uh, it was aimed at guests of restaurants and cafes in the old town and Kazimierz. Uh, the point of this was to show noisy tourists that uh, here lives also residents who go to work the next day and need to de deal with the daily staff. Over the thousand of English uh, language posters in three graphic versions were prepared and uh, something like similar stands on, with the leaflets on the tables were spread all over the Old Town, the first district. But what is very important to, uh, to remember that that campaign was most was totally to the end prepared in English language. It was totally uh, devoted to foreign tourists who were perceived as as the the biggest evil of the night time night activities. Uh, uh, the link between uh, alcohol consumption and urban tourism uh, and the urban tourism was made clear by the advert that was um, unfortunately proposed by the airline company American Airlines uh, in line with the plans of creation and air connection from Chicago to Krakow. Uh, the slogan of the post was formulated as follows. Have a vodka drink with a friend. It was the last straw that breaks the camel's back. Uh, this sparked numbers uh, protests uh, in the city, mostly generated by the city authorities and the inhabitants of the first district. Uh, on the right, uh, we can see the airline response to the to the president of the of Krakow, uh, uh, to the uh, directed to the city authorities, uh, 
issued uh, by the airlines uh, saying sorry uh, for uh, saying sorry for this insulting advert. Uh, American Airlines apologized for this idea, both to the city council and to the residents themselves, um, who were of course offended. Finally, uh, COVID blocked the, the, the launch, uh, the, this, uh, this connection, the launch of this connection. Uh, as a curiosity, I will also add, because maybe I have some small minutes extra. Uh, as a curiosity, I'm going to uh, show you that that banner, which is on the uh, uh, bottom left corner, uh, we can see the picture of the city. And although it adver it, it adverts, it promotes uh, the connection between Chicago and Krakow, on this picture there is Gdańsk. So I will not going to comment why that mistake happened further. Paradoxically, uh, Krakow, unlike other Polish tourist regions or cities, felt the effect of the COVID pandemic the most. Uh, the pandemic ravaged the entertainment atmosphere of the city. Um, it hit Krakow tourism drastically. The city statistics recorded a decline of 97-98% uh, in terms of persons accommodated in tourist accommodation facilities, foreign tourists and overnight stays. The revival started uh, the arrivals uh, to Krakow began in, be, began in June 2020 between second and the third wave of the pandemic. Um, in the middle of those two phases, uh, new attempts were made to look for a way to revitalize the hospitality sector in tourism. And it started from inhabitants. Uh, having in mind those previous problems with over tourism and tourism pressure and uh, th that impression of foreign tourists as the, the biggest evil of the night. Um, attempts were made to find a new client for post-pandemic tourism in Krakow, and on the other hand also, arouse the responsibility for tourism in the city within inhabitants, within the residents. Such an impulse to stimulate the inhabitants uh, of Krakow after the first phase of lockdown was the introduction of the action uh, in the summer season, be a tourist in your city. Uh, mm, it has one goal to encourage entrepreneurs, cultural institutions, foundations, associations to step shoulder to shoulder and inspire the, the residents of Krakow to use the numerous attractions of our city. Thanks to this, the Krakow economy, including the nighttime economy, local businesses, small entrepreneurs, tourist guides and cultural uh, and cultural institutions began, began to come to life. This action was also designed to redefine the concept of a tourism in, of a tourist in Krakow as a person who coming to the capital of the Małopolska become its resident for a short period of time. A resident who uses the same services that tourists use in a daily basis, a person who follows the same steps, the same rules as Krakow's residents. Uh, so, uh, in that that campaign, uh, uh, lots of pe lots of people were uh, uh, encouraged to uh, to participate. Also, inhabitants, and actually, it worked. Uh, I would like to present you some uh, uh, initial uh, results of our research conducted in June uh, in the in the period of time June October two thousand twenty. So. Uh, during the between the two phases of the pandemic on nighttime economy establishments. A research methodology methodology was focused on and involved several participants. Um, the authorities, uh, the, the, the city authorities, um, it involved field, field observations, uh, surveys of residents' opinions about the nighttime economy establishments, mapping of uh, changes in the city, which happened during the, the pandemic and after it, and interviews with nighttime economy with nighttime economy establishments uh, and entrepreneurs. Um, around two, uh, 120 questionnaires were collected, uh, and we were we were gathering the opinions about changes of their attitude to their business assessment of operating conditions uh, about the night major. Uh, I'm presenting the preliminary, preliminary, preliminary findings. It is also because the second phase of the pandemic will be held right now after uh, after the summer, because we really want to get to know the uh, the, the students' uh, perception and the students' opinion about uh, about uh, about nighttime economy. Uh, that table provides answers to the question. 
of whether today's nighttime economy depends on tourism. As we see, uh, the vast majority of respondents agree that contemporary urban tourism is, in, in, is linked very strongly with entertainment at night and Krakow's nightlife is an important magnet for tourists. They are already aware that nightlife in Krakow depends on locals. Over 70% of respondents claim that they will still operate even the, the COVID happened, even if the tourists will not going to be back after uh, the pandemic. The slide shows, this slide shows that distribution of entrepreneurs' opinions uh, uh, of whether the night causes social costs. And of course, we all know that uh, nighttime economy can cause the same problems that is happening when the over tourism, uh, or, or, yeah, over tourism phenomena is happening. Uh, over 60% of respondents claim that nightlife causes a number of, uh, n n uh, of nuances felt especially by residents, but that almost half of respondents claim that it is not due to the alcohol consumption, which actually was very visible since 2003 to 2019. Uh, this is a significant result because it's an opinion of, of nighttime economy uh, 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 entrepreneurs. Uh, the paradoxically, uh, paradoxically uh, almost half of the entrepreneurs interviewed do not see, do not perceive alcohol consumption after, after, uh, during the night, uh, with the noisy, uh, with the, with the noise that it can produce. I mean, after uh, digestion, uh, as a problem. Uh, this set of statements reflect the overall opinion of nighttime economy entrepreneurs after the COVID pandemic. Uh, the research carried out after the first lockdown in Poland indicated that entrepreneurs of nighttime economy do not intend to significantly change their entrepreneurial strategy and strategy and still envision the developmental potential of night activities. The most interesting result, on the other hand, uh, from the results, from the opinions, is that the vast uh, majority of the business owners claim that Krakow has a image of a city teeming with light night. They observed it in 2012 in summer, where their cafes, cafes, restaurants were open all day, but mostly the all day were empty because there was no tourists. In that time, in 2020, we were a lack of foreign tourists in Krakow. They were only in residents and residents during the day they were working. And after work, the cafes and restaurants were full, were packed. Only at night, the residents were leaving their jobs. The cafes and pubs were full. This means mainly that there is a significant indication that nighttime economy in Krakow is based mostly on locals, on local residents, not loud foreign tourists. Uh, one of the problems raised in the study also was the, the identification of nighttime economy entrepreneurs' opinion on the need to create the position of night major in Krakow. This concept was uh, developed before uh, in 2019, but was unsuccessful. Uh, but after that research, we already know that uh, only few entrepreneurs have even heard about the night major, uh, the role of night major. Uh, uh, and uh, it it is it is no need because only one quarter of the uh, of the of the survey of the of the uh, sample uh, claimed that this position at Krakow is not needed. Uh, Krakow sustainable tourism policy in two, uh, 2020 to 2025 is currently the only one tourism strategy in Poland regarding new tourism plans taking the, into account COVID-19. Through planning, uh, Krakow strives to prevent over-tourism from occurring, so it's learning from their own mistakes, trying to minimize, minimize it after the pandemic is over. Um, and uh, Krakow policy makes also first attempts to sketch the first framework for the nighttime economy in Krakow, a night policy uh, for the city after COVID-19. Uh, but in this document, uh, nighttime economy, night economy management, in, as this is written in the chapter number six, is treated only in terms of problems. What nighttime economy causes and what kind of problems caused is uh, caused by uh, uh, its 
activity for the city. There is unfortunately still no indication of how to develop nighttime economy in the night, as it would be expected uh, by uh, inter uh, or going to go in line with the interest of residents and tourists. Why it's so important now the, nowadays after the pandemic? Because very, I mean, a lot of um, uh, activities which were planned to introduce in 2020, 2021, were already planned in 2019, but the, uh, the situation changed, COVID struck, striked. Uh, and I'm not sorry to interrupt you, but time is getting very tight. I'm not sure if you can go to the conclusions. Yes, those are two last slides. Brilliant. Yeah, that's the conclusion. Actually, uh, I'm just going to briefly explain uh, what kind of activities are taken right now to pre uh, to to uh, develop nighttime nighttime economy, learning from them from the from uh, from the over tourism situation. Where learning from the over tourism problem, uh, the the crack of authorities were forced to change their thinking about the impact of nighttime economy on the quality of life of Krakow residents at night. Um, the solution uh, were three types of solutions were introduced. First, uh, the information campaign, respect Krakow, be quiet. But that campaign is mostly devoted to Polish visitors. So it is mainly first language is Polish, just English names are English words are hidden somewhere there because first of all that message is directed to the uh, residents be quiet people still living here the second uh, the second uh, uh, solution is uh, is introducing city helpers before pandemic when we didn't know that something like, like that going to happen those uh, city helpers uh, were um, hired to help people uh, for example, or appear in those places, those zones when the noise started to appear, where in the beer, next to beer gardens, they were uh, they were supposed to calm down the atmosphere before the police or the other authorities gonna appear. So they hired uh, tourist guides that, that they could speak three, four languages, but actually now it's not needed. They are speaking Polish because they are trying to calm down in that zones where the noise is appearing. To, because they are calling Polish visitors and residents. And the third situation is that the city hall uh, introduced the regulation that beer gardens, cafes can be open only till midnight or to 1 a.m. during the weekend to calm down the noise that um, uh, that is happening uh, when people are consuming alcohol and other drink outside, out, outside the cafes and bars. And the, 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 the main conclusions of those initial studies is that um, nighttime policy is a result of tourism strategies focused on volume and quality growth. It's developing not on the basis of foreign tourists, but on a local basis. It's driven by young people, students, young corporate employees, the millennials generation. The nightlife in Krakow is not the result of the development of tourism. So, rationally saying, supporting the development of tourism is a, is a good action. It's, a, it's an expected action, right? It's expected by, by a city's poli city policy. It, nas it does not create conflict situations. Why? Because the conflict will be anyway, <laughs> because it will be caused by the local users of the city. The new policy of night uh, after COVID-19 mu must balance the night economy with the needs of residents and tourists. Uh, because no matter what we do, what we're going to do to promote premium tourism in Krakow, nighttime uh, economy will still develop based on the activity of the city's inhabitants. So it's all locally roots. Uh, thank you for extending. I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm so sorry for extending. Thank you for, for 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 listening to this presentation. I saw that in chat there is already lots of questions and lots of comments. So thank you very much. I I was just only having a quick look at what was happening there because I was trying to explain the presentation. But I think maybe we're gonna have some time to uh, to focus on that comment as well. Thank you very much, Magna. Actually. 
I, for those who have been in conferences with me, and those who doesn't, I'm sorry for you. So my first, uh, in, 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 in the title of chair or host of the sessions, I always love to ask to the presenters to make a question to another person of the table, right? So it means, for example, that Magda can make a question to Jajali, Jajali can make a question to Brendan, and for example, um, well, that's, that's an example, but feel free to make your questions, okay? I saw in the chat, as Magda was commenting, that so many great um, common gra and grounds you could actually detect, especially in the case of Krakow, uh, with the overtourism and the commodity of the town, with the case of York, and also I presume that we are interested in to know the uh, economic dimension and policy of uh, Hungary. So, Gagali, you start with the first question. He has the micro, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, well, I, I don't know now uh, who should I start with, but let's see. Uh, so, um, so I, I, I um, also copied my questions uh, to the chat, but uh, yeah, I was just, so the, the most surprising thing uh, about this presentation in, in New York, that as far as I understood, there were more tourists after, you know, uh, local people were involved in this cultural production, but then wasn't it just reproducing the problems of over tourism? Um, uh, yeah. Brendan, I don't know if you want to come in on that, but I've got a couple of comments. Um, I think in terms of, of numbers, um, the focus for the destination management organization had traditionally been towards international inbound tourists. But um, as a result of um, the emerging uh, environment um, from COVID-19 in the summer of 2020, what the um, public authorities found was that when they galvanized um, local people, residents, stakeholders um, with powerful organizations like the, the attractions in the city, um, they actually were able to achieve um, numbers of sustainable tourism from local residents, from regional um, um, visitors and national visitors. Um, your point about over-tourism, well, um, there wasn't a feeling that, that, that the numbers of tour, uh, tourism in the city have actually reached levels of over-tourism in the sense that um, cities like, say, Lisbon or Barcelona or Venice have experienced. We're not at that level in New York yet. Um, and what we're arguing for is that actually by focusing more on a sustainable um, tourism market, which is locally based, um, that produces a greater sense of social life and authenticity in the city. Um, so, so at the moment, we're not at a stage where we can say in York, we have over tourism necessarily. And Brendan, please cut in if, if you have comments here. Yeah. But, um, do you want to say something? <laughs> Do you want to well, cut in? So, well, it's a really interesting uh, question. Oh, we've lost you. Can't think. Think. Can you hear me okay? You're breaking up, Brendan. Oh, no. No, I can now. You can now. Good. Yeah. I think it's it's really interesting uh, question, and I think what was interesting about this particular summer in in York, just gone in 2020, was that yes, we had lots of local people coming into city centre, but I think for the first time, the way in which the cityscape was managed and the flows around the city, because of social distancing, because of one way streets patterns that were implemented, um, it meant that it didn't feel crowded, and I think you know York. It's a very small medieval city. It's got a, a, a medieval wall that surrounds it, and it can feel quite closed in. And if you go in on a Saturday afternoon and 
you talk about stag and hen parties being an issue, you know, we have a similar problem in York. It can feel very busy. But I think because the local authority really managed the public flow and the way people use the city space, it had a much more positive impact on, on the space um, and meant that it didn't feel um, crowded, overcrowded like it did prior to the pandemic. Okay, so so this is something interesting that this because um, we don't really have that, but these these COVID rules make a more organized feeling basically. If I got to try, so that's that's interesting. Like um, because we were in a street festival uh, recently, in, for example, in 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 Gracia in Barcelona, and it was very organized. Who could see the concerts? But right next to the, you know, designated concert venue, there was a huge crowd, even more squeezed because half of the square or, or most of the square was designated to, you know, proper concert goers who were like social distancing. And then there wasn't social distancing at all, uh, like right next to these fences and and sitting places. But maybe, yeah, you said that. that basically the number of tourists is not that much alarming yet so it was manageable mm -hmm. okay so brendan now is your turn to make a question i think i'm really interested in hearing from both um, speakers about engaging mechanisms for engagement in uh, decision making in in activity within both of those destinations we've heard from so i'm going to throw it out to both presenters if i may if they could say a little bit more about you know the consultation mechanisms that take place and how people are involved and um, so it's genuine and it's not um, a tokenistic um, process hopefully you heard that okay I don't know if I'm if my sound is, is clear. So Magdalena, do you want to? Uh, I'll maybe put, go to to you then to, to kickstart that one. Uh, yeah, I would I, I would like to underline that uh, uh, Krakow is a very old city, so eight hundred years of the tradition. So all changes. You know, it's like 800 years of the tradition, so all changes were, were approaching or having a very long way. But in terms of that pandemic, COVID, and the, uh, uh, people's participation in the decision making process in Krakow started to rise and started to be uh, more vivid than it's ever been through the whole 800 years of tradition. And uh, I know that Robert may be going to mention much more because he's uh, he's literally involved in creating that policy from the uh, from the uh, from the side of uh, of the uh, city authorities uh, from the from this university perspective. Uh, but uh, as I know, as I, as, as I'm concerned, it's on. It's not only the local consultation. Marek Grohovic, the the co uh, co creator of this of this research and presentation, co uh, co researcher. He's involved in the in the works from the bottom, so he's he's speaking with with people. He's speaking, also preparing his PhD thesis with people about the tourism pressure, about the over tourism, and now, um, the, now in the in the city hall appeared the group, uh, maybe not lobbying, but trying to create the policy. Uh, f involving also that voice from uh, from the from the residents uh, and that uh, that discussion is very vivid in Krakow in many in social media on the on the meetings on the consultations uh, th that means uh, that means that uh, 800 years wall be, be, the, uh, can uh, can be actually overcome by all those changes, and it actually started from from the bottom up, from the above, not to top down. And what is also very interesting, I will not gonna uh, brag how wonderful the city hall in Krakow is because it's not my point. But uh, I will just mention that those people who are, are actually involved in 
cultural policy of Krakow and trying to reshape that image of Krakow as a very cheap tourism destination for weekends and holiday stack parties, hand parties, and so on and so forth. They really mention, they, they really insist on uh, uh, focusing on that new tourists and that image, that view of how Krakow can develop, which uh, focusing on the on this uh, uh, new uh, model of tourists, it really, it really attracts people. It really attracts uh, entrepreneurs. It really attracts local residents who are not against tourism at all because they are benefiting from it. But uh, that voice, uh, which also appeared in the citation, in the citations, that we love tourists, but those who really can appreciate the atmosphere and the, the city as as it whole, those tourists are appreciated and welcomed. And uh, I don't, you know, COVID really stopped it. The, the ideas from before that we're trying to uh, minimize the 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 the, the over tourism uh, uh, phenomena, the over tourism problem, they need to be directed into new trails. And I mean, uh, and, and what I mean is that uh, they are actually doing that. I mean, I'm observing it as a, as a, as a researcher, I'm observing it as also as a resident. And uh, those initiatives that I was mentioning here, I live already in that, that uh, reality. I'm trying to use um, the, the, the crack of atmosphere as much as I can because of the COVID rules and so on and so forth. But it is visible and it, it really, uh, I experience it already. So how we are, of course, in the phase bef before the fourth wave of the pandemic. So I cannot do, um, uh, I, I cannot do, you know, think about the, the, the further tempo of those changes. But it's something interesting is happening right now in this in the in between the waves, right? So I will, yeah, I will stop with that. Sorry, <laughs> maybe Robert would like to to share something. But I know that his his connection is very bad. So if he he will not gonna listen to us or he will not gonna have a connection, he will not gonna add anything. I'm sorry, Robert. Okay. I try to explain something about Krakow. Uh, this is a big city, but it's a really small city. Everyone uh, knows knows there. And uh, if we discuss about daytime economy and how to stop it, we have to remember that uh, some of this person who gives uh, bad comments on empty development has also tourist business too. Uh, so uh, this is a. Uh, um, this is a um, type of problems which is not easy to develop. Uh, and the second one, we, we are planning to discuss about nighttime economy, but we have to remember that we have uh, plenty of hotels, new investments in Krakow, and there is no tourist on city break. We have plenty of tourists in Poland, but on uh, in the mountains and in the, uh, at the seaside, but cities are empty. If someone visits the city, they stay just only four or five hours, not longer than one day. So uh, the pressure for uh, city hall is to how to bring the tourists to fool the hotels and other establishment. We search just only pubs because there was a big problem with them uh, before COVID. And we want to uh, know what they plan. Uh, after the COVID, we I think we have the same problems in the whole uh, tourist economy that the plenty of people who worked in this sector has changed their professions because if the tourist sectors are closed for five or six months during the uh, year, they have to earn, uh, get money for the uh, uh, for their families, and uh, we have the problems with tour guides in Krakow. We have the problems with person who works in restaurants, in hotels. So the main uh, uh, the main words you, you can hear in the city hall is to bring the tourists now because the sector is collapsing. Uh, so we, we can discuss about nighttime economy. But uh, maybe in next year, maybe next two years. But what what has changed? 
the first, the biggest change uh, we can observe is that most of uh, inhabitants uh, of Krakow uh, who lived in the uh, old town or Kazim, uh, Kazimierz district can say that not only the tourists are the problems, because the locals, people from Krakow, students, people from uh, small villages around Krakow are the anti are the nighttime uh, player too. Yeah, so, so I think that we, we have to wait for the new discussion about NTA uh, policy, but it's very good that we do something. Uh, so the city helpers, which we bring from Amsterdam, uh, the respect uh, campaign and the closure of uh, outdoor gar uh, pubs, uh, gardens. This is a very good uh, things we, we, we done till now. Thank you. Okay. And one, one word, we don't have uh, the night mayor, mayor, mayor uh, till now. Uh, two years ago, during the political elections in three cities, the people, the, the, there was a discussion about it in Krakow, Warsaw, and in Sopot uh, at the coast line. But uh, but there is no one uh, night mayor in Polish cities till now. Okay, thank you. Guys, we, this is I wanted to come back to Brendan, Brendan's question. Three minutes. Oh, so the, the whole point is that uh, in, in Budapest, you know, to have like this institution as nightmare and, you know, facilitate uh, negotiations and participation and et cetera. So the former mayor of Budapest, when this whole question of nightmare came up, he was a very conservative guy and he said, as far as I know, I'm the only mayor of this town. So he really just didn't get uh, the the essence of it that uh, for for this conflictual uh, position of nighttime economy, you need maybe you know experts or people to help. The only thing we had was self-proclaimed night mayor, who was never you know legitimated. But just uh, you know, basically, money was given by the biggest bars to to um, lobby for them, which is a very another kind of nightmare. That that is also an institution lobbying for nighttime economy, but nothing about you know finding solutions and and negotiations. And basically, my whole presentation was about this that in this political environment, uh, there is very little chance for that. So you can have a night mayor appoint someone, but if there is no uh, political culture, there are no institutions, and actually the national government just crosses over anything that you were talking about on local level, then it doesn't go. So uh, I'm just saying that in an international or whatever comparative project, it is a it is a very important aspect or issue that what are the Contextual political uh, circumstances. Well, guys, 